the reason it is redundant is because we are moving from an environment, a toolkit that was built in the industrial age around full-time employees. A person who lands up, who needs to be supervised. And hence our current toolkit is all about unlocking performance, supervising performance. And year on year, that's what we're trying to do, squeeze out more performance from this individual who turns up to an office. But the knowledge economy is very different. If you look at any disruptive and new age technology company, that is a good case study for what is happening as we shift over to a pure knowledge business. By 2025, 92% of companies on this planet will be knowledge economy companies. Even if you manufacture a car, you cannot do that using traditional technologies anymore. You will be a knowledge centric, you know, you'll have machines and robots and so on and so forth. And it will be run by, you know, your technology teams, not necessarily, uh, you know, old fashioned shop floor supervisors, uh, you know, uh, supervising people, fitting rivets and, and tightening engines and bolts and all that stuff. So the future is a lot more about dynamic capability management. And if you talk to most CEOs today, they tell me this has already happened to them. 10 years ago, they used to be very proud of their headcount numbers. I have 60,000 employees. Very proudly, you know, stand in the board meeting and stand in the AGM and say, I have 65,000 employees, we're a great big company. Today, they mumble that number. They don't say it with pride anymore because they're very worried the analysts are gonna say, but your competitor does it with 50. So headcount has become this, you know, it's become a source of anxiety. We were sitting there and she said with great confidence that we have 40,163 people as of 1st January this year, last quarter when they got that number in our talent ecosystem. And I said, but that's not the question I asked. I didn't ask how many employees you had. I didn't ask your headcount, your full-time equivalent. I asked, what's your current talent ecosystem? And by then, everyone had started to think that it's obviously well beyond that. Where are we sourcing capability from? Who contributes to creating value for our shareholders, customers, and employees? Not just your employees. So we took a break at that meeting and came back nine weeks later with this chart. And this was 2015. Right, 40,000 employees in 2015, less than 55% of their talent ecosystem was full-time. Now, which were the areas growing the fastest in sourced? This is mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, any other structure you use to bring in capability into your organization. Strategic partnerships, alliances, brand alliances, so on and so forth. This part was exploding across global enterprises. The other part exploding was core outsourced or offshored work. Now what this told us is that this piece of the pie, the orange piece of the pie, is shrinking rapidly and is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as the days go. And if this is the only thing that HR is worried about, then we will govern a smaller and smaller and more insignificant piece of the pie that builds capability for organizations. In fact, this is such a fundamental shift that it is going to rewrite the laws of management as described by Winslow Taylor's and rebooted by Peter Drucker in the 60s and 70s for the modern knowledge era. Today's management toolkit forces us to focus on supervising performance. Today's management toolkit drives performance. The future management toolkit is all about curating contribution from a disaggregated talent system. That is the role of managers. Getting different parts of the, of the talent ecosystem, of our capability ecosystem to work together. Does this make sense? We have so many different partners. These guys are governed by finance. These guys are governed by procurement. These guys are governed by HR. It's totally disconnected today. It's, it's, it's being managed in tactical realities in different parts of the organization. So when they saw this, all of them had an aha moment, saying, oh my God, it's already happened. Plus customers and employees.
and what works for your competitor may not work for you. Does that make sense? So forget copying what others do in other parts of the world. Two bank or two hospitality company shift. Can we control it? Can we influence it? If you're high, it's up there, it's less of a risk. If you're low, it means it's gonna play out, you have to respond, you cannot control it. And the other one is degree of difficulty. How complex will it be for us to change? Uh, how difficult will it make life for us and disrupt us? Using this and macro and micro talent economics, you can build a risk map for your business. I wanna show you a few examples of companies that have done this with us and what have they come up with? On the macro talent side, there are several risks that have emerged. The, the you know, crowdsourcing, locational preferences, job mobility, talent mobility, job mobility. Job mobility is massive. Any job that has moved, you know, a, a immigration boundary uh, and is now being done by somewhere else, <laughs> Over half the global economy has been impacted by job mobility. The biggest move, services has just started. Services $120 billion, technology $78 billion. These are minuscule. In the future, they will move even more. These are massive risks. So immature and we're not even there. So life in Russia was very difficult in the 1990s, especially in the early 1990s. If you're watching television, you would have seen those Russian bread lines that used to make, you know, four blocks, five blocks, people waiting for a loaf of bread. There was no jobs, there was no factories, apart from, you know, what was controlled by the government, and they were dying as investment faded out. Private industry hadn't risen to a dismal 1.1. You need 2.2 to replace the country. 1.1 means babies that should have been born that weren't.